This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Well, thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's great to see a big crowd right here. You know, one, one thing just come to my mind, if we keep having big crowd for the energy seminar for the next five to 10 years, this country has a hope to overcome the energy problem. Let's keep doing that. Um, so today I'm going to uh, tell you um, uh, what I do in my research group, how to design nanomaterials for uh, energy storage uh, for batteries and silver capacitors. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, a bunch of people. Um, first of all, I get very talented, uh, whole list of talented graduate students right here. So they all contribute to the work to a certain degree, particularly uh, Candace Chan uh, and, uh, and postdoc Li Feng and Jan and uh, a few other graduate students. Um, I would like to also uh, acknowledge, you know, I have very good collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Bob Huggins. He's the super expert in these areas. Actually, battery expertise spread out from Stanford to uh, other campus. You perhaps didn't know about that. Uh, also, Professor Ricardo um, Lufo, coming from Italy during the summer time, spent half a year in my group. And Professor uh, Don Kyo Kim from Korea also spent some, some time in my group uh, developing the uh, battery programs. Uh, I have a bunch of other collaborators. And also, I would like to thank uh, GSAC for the funding support. Uh, this is a really gracious support, a really large amount of support allowed the program to go. Now recently joined by uh, KAUST and ONR to support this work. Um, so I would like to start by several slides of introduction about energy storage. Um, uh, the importance of energy storage, you more or less have day-to-day -day life examples, uh, mostly in the uh, portable electronics areas. Um, you know about cell phones, laptops, so this relies on batteries, that's energy storage device, to uh, really drive this application going. Um, looking at the future, uh, what's really important is uh, how, how to electrify vehicles and uh, have hybrid. Uh, plug-in and electrical vehicles. Um, since uh, transportation accounts for about 25 to 30 percent of carbon dioxide emission, so getting uh, vehicles electrified has a significant meaning to the uh, environmental problem, not only just the energy problem. Um, while looking at even bigger scale, you look at large scale energy storage uh, come together with solar, with wind, these are the renewable energy sources that are not available every time, uh, you know, all the time during the, uh, during the night. Um, they, you need to come out energy storage to store this energy so you can use it at different time when you really need it. Um, grid connected energy storage become more and more important. And did you said just sent out a proposal call, I believe that was last night or this morning, asking for a grid connected energy storage ideas. So this huge market right there and uh, connecting with building, of course, is very important as well. Um, these three areas of uh, applications represent you know, different excitement, different scale, and but they share a common properties in thinking about energy storage. Let's look at the current technology for store energy. Um, I only list four right here. Um, related to how do you uh, store electricity, how do you use electricity. Um, capacitors, silver capacitors, batteries, and fuel cells. Um, this plot is the uh, power density versus uh, energy density um, for different technology. Going from capacitors to fuel cell, first of all, the energy density is increased uh, dramatically. Um, and the power drops, though. And the capacitors has very high power, uh, uh, but not enough energy density. Now you look at all, the impo all these important parameters related to uh, uh, energy storage technology, which include energy density, power density, um, cycle life and safety, and cost. Depending, depending on which areas of application you're talking about, 
portable electronics, electrical vehicles, or large-scale energy storage. This is a different emphasis of these parameters. Uh, but ideally, you would like to have every parameters to be as high as possible. Of course, the cost to be as low as possible. Um, so for most of the audience right here, I see perhaps a lot of undergraduates sitting right here. Let me, uh, 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 before, uh, 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 let me tell you uh, uh, what we do in the group. But before we do that, uh, uh, let me show you some background slides uh, on the energy storage mechanisms. Um, let's look at capacitors. In high school physics, you learn about this. You know, capacitors, uh, they are two parallel plate, metallic plate, come close to together, separated by a dielectric. This is an insulating layer. Well, typically, the thickness you can reduce down to about a micron size also. Not too small unless you use semiconducting, uh, semiconductor fabrication technology to deposit very thin film. Otherwise, this is not going to be very small. So you have these two metallic plates. Uh, you store the energy in, t in form of charges. They, stick, uh, they stay on the surface interface right here. Um, the energy density is related to the capacitance of your uh, capacitor, and also the voltage you apply to charge up these capacitors. Well, this capacitance value C um, scales inversely uh, with the thickness of this uh, dielectric layer. That means, you know, uh, the dielectric, dielectric layer, you can only get down to about a micron also. You know, the amount of energy you can store is not that big because you have this uh, uh, thickness to be quite large. Um, Supercapacitors or say electrochemical capacitors use a different mechanisms to store uh, energy, slightly different, uh, but more or less similar to capacitors. So the idea is how do you reduce this dielectric thickness down to nanometer scale, about a thousand times smaller. Um, the idea is to you put, take these two pieces of metals, instead of using uh, dielectrics, now you use uh, electrolyte solution. So it's in, uh, for example, aqueous solution. Uh, you have salt, dissolved in the aqueous solution. So you have ions in the, in the solution. If you apply a voltage, um, positive this side, you accumulate negative ions. That's anions on this surface. Cation with positive charge go to the right-hand side, uh, electrodes. Now the capacitance of these uh, uh, supercapacitors the relevant length scale is the separation between the positive charge and negative charge. This is extremely small. Uh, the relevant thickness now is so-called uh, double layer thickness. You know, with uh, say 100 millimolar or molar ionic concentration, this is uh, less than a nanometer also. Looking at the length scale, so you reduce the distance uh, between the charge, um, positive and negative charge, you increase the capacitance dramatically, and then you can increase the energy you can store uh, dramatically. Um, that's why you see the previous plot right here. Silver capacitors now move to the right-hand side of the plot. Um, now look at the look at the, looking at the batteries. Um, batteries is uh, you can store even more charges. Um, capacitors and silver capacitor relies on the uh, relies on surface to store a charge. Now battery relies on the whole bulk of the materials. You put all these metal ions into the, into the crystalline lattice of these uh, electrodes. Uh, and uh, I use negative uh, uh, charge on the other side. Uh, and then in the battery case, you don't see this uh, positive charge and negative charge. You see the oxidation state change within the materials inside the battery electrodes. Um, this can store even more energy. Um, at the end, the difference you see is um, this is a uh, capacitors and supercapacitors is surface storage, and batteries is a box storage. That's why a battery store a lot more energy. Now, next question is, you know, look at the title of this talk, uh, design nanomaterials to uh, impact this uh, energy storage. Now, how, what exactly nanotechnology can do? Why nanomaterials can help energy storage? Um, now, let's look at battery case first. To get these uh, metal ions, um, into the bulk of the electrodes. So they need to diffuse a long distance if this is a big piece to go into the electrode. Um, so you don't like it. Um, it's going to be slow. Uh, the way to improve it, if you make this electrode, this big piece into tiny particles, um, 
So each of these particles contact with the electrolyte. Uh, now the uh, metal ion going in rate can be speed up very fast. The distance uh, required this ion to go in is, becomes very small. So and by doing this way, you can improve uh, the speed, the power of your devices. Um, of course, these uh, particles need to stick onto a metallic uh, uh, collector. So I use this to indicate this is a metal collector. So what about this? You know, instead of using particles, um, uh, let's use another uh, format of uh, nanostructure, such as a uh, so-called nanowire. This is a wire shape. You know, the benefit you gain, uh, not only you reduce the distance, um, the ions going into the battery materials, at the same time, you compare with the particles, you know, to really use the batteries, you only need to, not only need to move ions, you also need to move electrons. So in this case, electron needs to ship from the metal electron going into the particles. Um, this needs to hop because between particles, there's a particle-particle particle resistance right there at the interface. So it's not that efficient. Now you go to nanowires, uh, this is like a highway, it just goes in very fast. Well, it looks like you can use the nanowires to uh, improve both uh, ionic conductivity and uh, electronic conductivity. The story holds the same for supercapacitors. Um, for supercapacitors case, if you go from uh, metals, big piece of metals, now to these uh, you know, uh, small size particles, now going to the nanowire, you gain the same advantage. You, know, you speed up the ele electronic conductivity, you speed up the ionic conductivity. Um, so that has been the idea, general uh, ideas uh, we have been thinking about in our research group. Um, not talking about the detailed materials yet, this is the common benefit you can gain by using a nanomaterial, efficient electron transport and a large surface area for a large ion flux to uh, increase the ionic conductivity. So now speaking of our nanowires, we are going to focus on nanowires now. Um, in the last about uh, 10 years or so, you know, there's a lot of development in the nanowire areas. I uh, give several examples as a background uh, coming from leading research group, uh, uh, Lieber Group, Samuelson Group, and Peidongyang Group at Berkeley. Um, so in and, and the early days of uh, nanowire de development, a lot of uh, attention uh, fo is focused on um, uh, uh, making a fa faster and faster transistors and, and later move on to uh, uh, sensors, chemical and biological sensors based on the field effect. When I was a still graduate student, uh, this is uh, my own work with Lieber. Um, and how to use this nanowire to move photons around. So there's a nanoscale photonics area, really big areas now. Um, and how to use this, this nanostructure for solar cells, nanogenerators for energy conversion. Um, there's also significant effort at Stanford campus right here. Um, I give a list of a research group having res a nanowire research program on this campus, uh, ranging from material science to electrical engineering, chemistry, and, uh, and mechanical engineering, so you can, you can name it. So it's a really exciting effort on this campus. Um, in my own research group, you know, the focus has been how do we really think about tailored nanomaterials for energy applications, for also for other applications. So we figure out how to control the shape. In this case, this is a, you know, a nanowire with, with the branch structure coming out and these beautiful helical branches uh, uh, by controlling the, the growth condition. Um, you can form a really nice ribbon. Um, you can make these uh, vertical pillars. This is not only pillars, this is a cone-shaped structure. Um, you can make this a helical structure as well. Uh, you can uh, control it to certain degrees now. So my research program has been how do we use these materials and design them very well for energy storage, solar cells, memories, and a bioprobe. So today I'm going to only tell you the uh, one area, that's energy storage. Now let's look at the first example. Uh, uh, there's two outlines right here. Um, somehow the slide doesn't. So I'm going to tell you a first uh, area related to batteries. But let me mention how we made these nanomaterials. Uh, I'll mention it a little bit so you have some background. Um, the way we made these materials, uh, this is the material we would like to make into nanowire. We heat, heat up the furnace and it vaporizes this material, get, uh, carry gas com, coming down. 
and take it to the downstream. This is a little bit lower temperature with these uh, nanoparticle catalyst, metallic catalyst on the surface. Um, this uh, nanoscale catalyst functions as a really good solvent above a certain temperature to dissolve this material from vapor phase going into liquid phase. Uh, after supersaturation, the nuclei and grow into this one-dimensional nanowire structure. Um, now let me show you the first uh, example on the uh, uh, nanowire lithium-ion batteries areas. So we, we care about lithium-ion batteries you know, among all the battery technology. It's because it produced the highest performance so far in terms of the energy density per unit volume or per unit weight. Uh, uh, much better than nickel metal hydride, nickel cadmium, and lead acid batteries. Um, so, but you look at the, the what, what's really the problem uh, related to lithium-ion batteries. Now let's look at the, you know, the 101 of batteries uh, related to lithium ions. Um, Lithium-ion batteries have two electro. Uh, one electro is uh, uh, carbon, that's a negative electro. The other electro is uh, transition metal oxide uh, as a positive electrode. So you will have a carbon collector right here to collect the uh, charge carriers. Um, uh, the real battery really look like a jelly roll. So this uh, carbon collector is a thin foil. You can roll them up into the battery. This is a top bill with, uh, uh, with may maybe like a meter long of a tape. Um, I, and this is how they look, uh, it's a cylinder cells. Um, the most critical parameters now related to batteries, uh, particularly towards electrical vehicles application is the energy density. That is determined by um, how many lithium ions you can store in this battery electro, what's the voltage, the potential difference between negative and positive electrodes. And, uh, and, and this is, you have a per unit volume or per unit weight uh, uh, parameter right there. Um, looking at all these uh, battery materials working so far, um, uh, anode, that's negative electrode, is uh, dominated by carbon. Uh, it can store the number of charge, that's a 370 milliamp hour per gram. So just forget about you know, the unit, this is conventional unit. Uh, just remember this number a little bit. And the cathode materials is more or less a lithium cobalt oxide or lithium manganese oxide spinner or lithium ion phosphate. You know, among this big family of the materials, materials, they more or less have the similar energy density as well, a similar charge storage capacity. That is also why, you know, with only these four materials, they really dominate the market. And uh, you look at Japanese company, Korean company, and, uh, uh, and Chinese company, they all use these materials for batteries. Um, look at the battery's performance, lithium ion battery performance and the energy density, green curve and the red curve. Um, since 91, Sony uh, uh, commercialized the first lithium ion batteries is about uh, 18 years now. Um, the battery's improvement is not that big. It's, on the average, it's only 8% per year also. Uh, that's very, very unaggressive. Um, and uh, this improvement indeed is not due to new materials improvement. It's more or less due to better and better packaging. But you cannot do this forever. That's why recent years you see saturation of uh, energy density of per unit volume or per unit weight. Uh, if you look at it 2008 uh, compared with 2007, there's no improvement at all. Um, so clearly new materials are needed to uh, uh, develop uh, better batteries. Um, so my group has been looking into the future generation of materials which are different from the uh, uh, previous generation. In a sense, the uh, new materials can store a lot more lithium ions, but they have the drawback that is the uh, large structure change and in, uh, in, uh, volume expansion. And lithium ions moving rate can be slow. Um, this is exactly the ideal system for designing nanomaterials to overcome those problems. So, and uh, I mentioned to you, nanomaterials materials in general have, uh, have two advantages. One is the uh, uh, shorter lithium diffusion distance, so lithium can come in very, uh, into the center of the material very fast. And second is uh, very efficient electron transport. For the materials which can store a lot of lithium, you gain one more advantage, that is, uh, when you have large structure change and volume expansion, they don't break. 
uh, uh, for example, you take a nanowire growing up from a, a, a metallic substrate surface, lithium ion comes in, they expand, but they don't break because each of the, these nanowires are small enough to take this, uh, uh, the, the strain uh, in, induced by the structural change. Um, one example is silicon. Um, silicon has been uh, uh, looked at for many years, and did Professor Bob Huggins right, right here you know, look at this material perhaps 30 years ago uh, before. Uh, even, maybe even before I was born. Um, so um, compared with carbon, and uh, silicon provide extremely high uh, uh, energy density, charge storage uh, capacities. But the problem is the volume expansion. So when something expands by 300%, you know it's going to break, unless it's uh, nanomaterials. Um, and you might want to ask why nanomaterials don't break. You know, I have told a lot of people this story. Uh, if you don't have any mechanical background, uh, the, uh, the idea is you take a piece of uh, very brittle silicon wafer. Well, you just smash it, you know. Uh, then you produce silicon dust. And those silicon dust, more or less in the size scale of a micron scale. Now we made our nanowires. They are already smaller than a uh, micron scale, so you cannot break nanowires anymore. They're smaller than the smallest things you can break. So we use the, uh, this method, the ca catalytic method, using the metallic particles under the CVD growth condition and grow this nanowire directly out of metallic substrate. You really gain the advantage, the bonding right here is a chemical bonding, very, very strong. So you don't need to use any binder to hold this nanowire together. You don't need to use a conducting carbon to help the conduction because uh, the electron transport is so efficient within the nanowires. These are the nanowires you get, typically uh, about 100 nanometer diameter also. <coughs> These are the uh, battery cells we make. What we do is we, we take the nanowires on the metallic electrodes, and then there's a counter electrode. You know, to test the nanowire electrode, we use lithium foil as the counter. And we, we press them together, and between we have an uh, uh, insulator, a, a separator right there uh, to uh, prevent shorting. But this separator, they are porous, allow you to put an electrolyte so lithium ion can conduct in between the two uh, electrodes. Um, this is the potential curve you, you, you measure. Uh, you, you monitor the voltage versus uh, uh, capacities. So you give a constant color, you monitor its potential. As soon as you put in lithium ions, the potential drop close to zero. But let me remind you, we are doing this measurement versus lithium metal electrode. So this doesn't mean when you use silicon nanowire for the batteries combined with uh, cathode material, the, the voltage is zero. If it's zero, you, know, you don't gain any energy. This is only half of the cell to allow us to evaluate silicon nanowires. So potential uh, show a plateau, and you, you discharge this and, and charge it again. So this allows you to uh, uh, calculate the capacity. Um, uh, in very early day, this is almost the first set of data we produce. Um, or uh, we can go, go, down, go up to extremely high charge storage capacity for multiple cycles. Now this is uh, silicon nanowires. This line right here is carbon. So we, we produce about 10 times of the carbon uh, uh, charge storage capacity. Uh, that has been very exciting. Um, now the uh, question you ask is, you use this nanowire, whether you can produce high enough uh, uh, power density, high enough current density to power your uh, iPhone, for example. Um, so we have done uh, uh, the rate dependence charging discharging. C over 20 right here, this is the battery terminology, means 20 hours charging and discharging. Um, and uh, once is one hour, uh, and the one hour charging discharging, this is a per percentage uh, uh, advantage over carbon, you can still have the capacity 500% uh, more than carbon. So that's very exciting. And the 1C right around here, you are really approaching the uh, current density, uh, allow you to do uh, uh, your laptop and cell phone charging, discharging. Well, how many cycles we can run now? Um, uh, well, it looks like this uh, nanowire, they're robust enough, allow us to uh, go for many, many cycles. And, uh, but we, we didn't push nanowire that hard. You know, if something you, uh, anything you push them very hard, you want to charge 4,000 milliamp, that's their full capacity. 
well, you are going to break them after you know, tens of cycles. So we decide to try about 1,000. 1,000 already three times of carbon. Well, you can run for close to 200 cycles uh, with a very, very little fading of capacity. You, you keep 95% of capacity. Um, so what about you know, the breaking problem? Breaking has been the biggest problem for silicon. Um, so after we do battery charging, we look at how the nanowires uh, uh, look like under scanning electron microscope. This is before lithium coming in. This is uh, after uh, multiple time of charging and discharging. Uh, one information you get out is nanowires they don't break. Uh, they still look like nanowire. And second thing is uh, their diameter becomes bigger. They become fatter, uh, but they still don't break. So that's a good news. Uh, this is uh, consistent with what we, what, what we are thinking. Um, uh, we have done a lot of detailed studies to look at you know, structural change, to look at what's happening in the interface, but I'm not going, going into the detail of that. Let me just show you the most uh, important thing you see in the silicon. I uh, use that uh, for uh, uh, batteries, electro. That is the structural transformation process. The nanowire we made after we do the synthesis, they are single crystal nanowires. Um, and uh, you look at this uh, under transmission electron microscope. This is a crystalline lattice. You can see it's a single crystal. Electron diffraction shows this spot pattern. That tells you it's single crystals. And with some lithium coming in, um, part of nanowire now become amorphous. And uh, part of uh, nanowire is still single crystalline. Um, so this is amorphous silicon with lithium in it. And uh, after you put more and more lithium in, now crystalline nanowire become almost completely amorphous, leaving behind this dot. That's a tiny, tiny crystalline of silicon. At the end, uh, these nanowires you know, completely become amorphous. After you, do, uh, uh, you get lithium in, uh, a lot of lithium in, they, all, they become amorphous completely. Our detailed study have shown um, this is really the picture happening. During the first cycle, when you charge lithium into silicon, it goes through this transformation going from crystalline to amorphous through this uh, different uh, uh, stage. Um, and um, now if you do, you take out lithiums, so you start with this uh, amorphous uh, silicon with lithium in it, now you take out lithium, and um, uh, more or less the, uh, this uh, silicon nanowire shrink a little bit, but not completely back to the original crystalline structure. This is still quite big. Um, if you do multiple cycles, uh, this size can, can increase a little bit more, maybe approaching to, to, to this side uh, after you do multiple cycles. Um, so now the key information I would like you to get is uh, this a crystalline phase involved, this amorphous phase involved. Now you go back and look at our potential curve. Uh, when you charge up your batteries, during the first charge cycles, so you, you need to go down to low potential to charge lithium into silicon. When you get to right here, they all become amorphous. Now you take lithium out. You come to the second cycle, you charge it, charge it again. Um, and you, you start with amorphous silicon nanowire from here, start to put lithium in. Now you start to see this potential uh, value you need to have to charge up lithium, to charge lithium into amorphous silicon. It's different from the potential you charge lithium into crystalline silicon. So it is different between amorphous and crystalline. Well, that act really activates our mind. Well, we are keep thinking whether it's a, it's a good idea to um, um, you make a, a, a nanowires uh, with a single crystal core, and then you have amorphous shell. And when you charge your batteries, um, you only charge the amorphous phase because you can control this uh, voltage potential allow you only charge out the amorphous phase, leaving this single crystal core, single crystal core right there uh, uh, without any change. So you have this uh, single crystal core function as a mechanical backbone, efficient electron transport pathway, allow you to run many, many cycles without breaking, and allow you to do extremely fast charging and discharging. That would be extremely important for the electrical vehicles, for example. Um, so we decide to test this idea, and uh, when we charge up the batteries, we only charge up to this potential. Uh, 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 if we can make a amorphous and uh, a crystalline shell and core nanowires, so we decided to do it. We made a single crystal nanowire by uh, also this uh, nanoparticle catalyzed growth. After that, we changed the growth condition a little bit, allow you to deposit a 
amorphous silicon indicated by the red color on the surface of the single crystal core. Um, so we have done extensive study um, to show you, you know, this is uh, single crystalline nanowires in the core. These are the amorphous shell. Um, now you look at the size scale. Your single crystal nanowires, uh, when we make them, um, we can make them in about diameter, about 20 nanometer or so. When you coat the amorphous silicon shell, this thickness right here can go up to 100 nanometer or bigger. Um, now you calculate the single crystal core volume only accounts for about 2% of the total volume. It's also about 2% uh, of, of the total weight. So by using this idea, you are not really wasting weight uh, uh, because you are never used a single crystal near a core. So you worry about maybe you waste this weight or volume uh, for the batteries. Indeed, you are not wasting much, only 2%. Um, but the payback you, you gain is huge. Um, this is the cycling data, capacity versus cycle number. This we run for 100 cycles. We run extremely fast rate, only use seven minutes to charge up your battery and discharge your batteries. Um, since we, we limited our potential for charging, so we are not going to reach, say, 3,000 or 4,000 milliamp hour per gram of capacity. That's very high. We perhaps only reach close to uh, 1,000 also. But that's good enough. You know, this is uh, three times of carbon. That's very high. What you gain is you gain extremely fast charge, charging, discharging rate. And uh, also, your lifetime becomes extremely long. Uh, within uh, 100 cycles, you really don't see uh, any decay. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's really the fundamental ideas uh, within my group. How do you design your nanomaterials for energy applications? You know, combining all these factors together, combining the expertise we have in the nanosynthesis to uh, create new materials to provide a better performance. So to compare, um, if you limit the charging potential to about 150 milliwatt, you don't go below that. After tens of cycles, you can see this crystalline core still inside. So maintaining some mechanical support, electrical support to allow you to do extremely fast charging, discharging. And if you uh, charge out your battery, this core shell nanowire using very low potential. After you charge it once, the whole nanowire becomes amorphous. You don't see this uh, crystalline core anymore. Well, that is consistent with our ideas. So, you know, we can maintain this uh, crystalline core by limit the charging potential. Let me summarize a little bit uh, research related to silicon. So we briefly solved the biggest problem, that's the uh, mechanical breaking problem by using nanowire structures. Um, and uh, let me also emphasize you know, the importance of silicon. You know, silicon is so abundant, so anything you can do on silicon will be great. But everyone will, ask, will be asking you, well, there's not enough silicon in the world. But those are referred to solar grade silicon, high purity silicon. And for batteries, you don't really need to use high purity. Metallurgical grade is good enough. It's like uh, maybe $100 per ton a uh, price. So it's extremely cheap. Um, this mature semiconductor manufacturing process allow you to think about manufacturing of the nanowire for the battery. So that's a good news, particularly for Silicon Valley. Um, what about the safety? You know, giving silicon can store so much energy in it, so, so many lithium, lithium ions in it. So and, uh, safety will be a concern. Um, but uh, let me uh, uh, tell you, uh, well, you know, so something. This is speculation uh, only, so there's no experimental data yet. So silicon, uh, when you charge uh, uh, lithium into silicon, uh, the potential is uh, higher than uh, uh, lithium metals by about 100 milliwatt or 200 milliwatt also. Well, if you use carbon that is in the existing technology, that's really close to zero watt uh, compared with uh, lithium metals. So uh, carbon has this well known problem, lithium dendrite formation if you overcharge charge your batteries. When lithium dendrite is formed, that causes shorting, that causes uh, explosion of the batteries uh, uh, later. Um, particularly in the cold weather, so uh, lithium dendrite can be formed even easier uh, um, if you overcharge it. Now you have this uh, potential slightly, slightly higher than uh, lithium metals. That allow you, uh, f when you use silicon, that allow you to prevent this problem, the lithium dendrite formation problem. And the second thing is uh, uh, just by thinking about uh, uh, the electro itself, a battery electro. You know, when silicon burn, uh, what does it produce? 
some chemists right here. It produces glass, also it's sand, or it's silicon dioxide. When carbon burns, it produces what? Greenhouse gas, uh, it's gas, so it's going to explode. Uh, oh, just this is by thinking about the electrode itself. Of course, you have organic electrolyte inside. That's the most dangerous part. It's not the electrode. Uh, but this is fun to compare. Well, um, our research didn't stop right here. So when you look into what's happening in silicon nanowires, um, this is the overall picture. You take a crystalline silicon nanowire, you push lithium in, they become amorphous. You take lithium out, they stay in amorphous. So you're cycling your amorphous phase. Um, this is your amorphous nanowire. They look bigger than your crystalline nanowires. So that allows you to think, you know, is this only the amorphous phase? They look bigger, so much bigger than crystalline. There got to be some uh, nanopores inside. So the real picture is like this. You have a lot of polar structure within silicon. Well, this is a really, really exciting. Um, this is a process allow you to use electrochemical cycling to create nanopores, uh, come out a new set of the new materials uh, uh, to uh, think about other applications. So um, let me remind you the silver capacitors again. So I said using nanowire can be beneficial for silver capacitors because you increase the surface areas, you, you have efficient electron transport. Um, now having these uh, nanopolar nanowires for silver capacitors is going to be even better. Um, now you have this, a lot of these pores. This create additional surface areas to uh, increase your um, capacitance and to increase your energy density of silver capacitors. And at the same time, they are well connected. All these materials are well connected, so they are still uh, provide uh, efficient electron transport pathway. Um, so we decided to explore this idea. Um, but let's look at the structure a little bit. Um, this is a single crystal silicon nanowire. This is after one lithium ion cycling. So you push lithium in, you take lithium out, you go look, look at them under a transmission electron microscope. Well, the, this is single crystal, you see the lattice plane. This look like become amorphous now, uh, the, uh, but you don't see a lot of feature yet uh, because the pore size are so small, so it's not really that visible. Uh, on the uh, transmission electron microscope. But after five lithium ion cycling, you see the roughness becomes more. What well, this allow you to believe, you know, maybe they really pause inside, but you cannot resolve them clearly because if you have a lot of pores, your electron being coming down, go through so many pores. So this average out, but, but more or less the roughness becomes uh, larger. So this gives you some indication. You know, you might have nanopore right there. So we have, um, uh, uh, study uh, this uh, nano, the porosity of this uh, nanowire after cycling by doing uh, uh, the absor gas absorption measurement. So I'm not going to go into the, this data. Let me just tell you uh, w w what we found. Um, so the overall finding is um, this is the size of the pore. This is distribution, uh, the uh, number of the pores, for example. And um, uh, let's zoom in, just look at these areas that's on the right hand side. Uh, after one lithium ion cycle, you get lithium in, you take lithium out, you create pore. The pore size has a distribution about, say, three nanometer or so. No, very, very small pore. Um, and then you, do, you can do multiple cycling. You can do three cycle, five cycle. It looks like the, the size of the pore shift to the right hand side, so become bigger and bigger. Well, this is uh, fascinating to me. Um, this is the way you can use electrochemical cycling depending how you do it, how many cycles you do. You can control the pore size, allow you to tune materials property uh, designed for uh, uh, silver capacitors. Um, so we have done silver capacitors measurement and figure how, how <coughs> the capacitance, surface capacitance, uh, when you do multiple lithium ion battery cycling, you create pore and then you do silver capacitors measurement. Uh, it really increases with uh, multiple cycling, so you increase the surface areas accessible to those uh, 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 ions and the electrolyte. Um, now let me tell you the overall conclusion we found. This is the energy density and power density. I, I, I apologize for the different plots. So I use a one, I use a power density along this axis and energy density. And my postdoc gave me this slide and just uh, reversed the order. But more or less the, uh, the parameters you're looking for is you would like to move everything to the right and to the, to the top. 
and to improve your uh, performance. This circle indicating uh, nowadays you, the things you can do, uh, the current technology can do, the state of the art technology can do uh, in terms of the energy density and power density. Silicon nanowire, when used as a supercapacitor electrodes, uh, used an organic electrolyte, will allow you to increase the uh, electrochemical supercapacitor energy density by 10 times now. So we, we show that so we can beat any other peoples in the world in terms of this uh, uh, energy density. Um, and the power density is more or less uh, similar to the uh, existing supercapacitors. So that's very exciting. Um, uh, uh, this again com comes back to the fundamental idea. How do you design your materials right, control the land scale right, control the morphology right, to uh, have a better performance for the uh, uh, energy storage. So there's some more new development in the groups. Um, a lot of phenomena we are looking at, for example, you look at silicon. Uh, it goes from crystalline phase to amorphous phase and involving dramatic structural transformation. You've got to understand that. So we are developing new tools to really uh, uh, allow us to observe this transformation uh, in real time with the nanometer angstrom scale uh, spatial resolution. We are also develop a well defined samples to even look at this phen phenomenon more clearly. I'm going to show you what I mean in a couple of slides. But now let's look at the, uh, the new technique we are developing in the group. Um, now we are trying to combine transmission electron microscope that has the spatial resolution about angstrom scale uh, with electrical chemical measurement, that's your battery measurement. You would like to do your battery measurement inside t transmission electron microscope, that's TEM. So we could call it in situ study. Um, my uh, graduate student David Shong, Stephen Master, and uh, postdoc Hai Lin, they have been developing this technique over the last two years. And uh, here's the device we made. This has a really thin silicon nitride membrane, a really transparent to the high energy electron beam, about 50 nanometer also. We made our nanowire device on top of this uh, membrane. So you can throw down a nanowire and then you mo make multiple electrical contact. We haven't been able to do battery measurement yet, we are, but we have the data related to phase transformation for other projects and memory. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, you know, to give you the example, what kind of things are you expecting? Um, these are the device, device we made. This is a nanowire, single nanowire contacted by multiple electrodes. So we will, soon enough, we are going to put down electrolyte and counter electrode. We would like to do in situ battery measurement. But now let me show you the examples we have for the, uh, another project, phase change memory. In the phase change memory case, this uh, increasing to amorphous phase transformation as well. We would like to apply electrical current to draw heat, draw, to do draw heating to heat up the nanowire above its melting point and see what happens. So this allows you to do a, a memory uh, change from crystalline to amorphous, amorphous to crystalline. Um, well, for a while, a lot of people think, you know, this is a simple memory mechanism, crystalline to amorphous, amorphous to crystalline. So now we can watch this in real time on the transmission electron microscope. Well, a lot of other things happen other than crystalline and amorphous transformation. So this is a nanowire coated by, a, uh, uh, encap encapsulated by a layers. Now you, it pass current through it, it's going to melt. Size is about 100, 200 nanometer or so. You start to see materials moving around like crazy, forming this nanotube structure, it's hollow. Um, um, so you see this IV curve current really go like crazy. Um, so we hope to use this uh, similar type of technique to do our silicon nanowire battery measurement and also do other materials battery measurement, allow you to watch this in real time and really understand and also control uh, your materials property better. Um, so we are interested in new well-defined samples. Well, this was the TM picture I just showed you, you know, 10, 20 slides ago. Um, so we made this nanowire, they are randomly oriented. Nothing wrong with this nanowire. They are nanowire usable for batteries. But for fundamental understanding, given a certain amount of lithium going in, you want to see how much volume change you have, and you would like to see whether there's a breaking at the interface between nanowire and the metal electrode. Well, that's harder to do. Now, this looks very messy. So what we like to have is this type of pillar. So each nanowire you can watch clearly, you make them into the same size. Um, so that motivates us to uh, develop 
uh, uh, the technique to uh, make this uh, nano pillar. Um, but the story I'm going to tell you is as soon as we get this pillar, uh, some other exciting things happen. This is always you know, how the science uh, develops. You, know, you think about some other things. It turns out this structure is very good for solar cells. Um, so the way we made this structure, um, we produce this silicon dioxide nanoparticles. We functionalize the surface and uh, <coughs> float them onto water surface, form a monolayer. So you compress these particles, they form close pack monolayer. Now you did a substrate. This can be a silicon substrate into this uh, solution. And uh, you just put it out, you get a monolayer of particles on, on the surface uh, uh, of this uh, substrate. Um, this is how they look like. This is four inch wafer. Um, you look at everywhere on the, uh, the substrate surface, you always see a nice monolayer of particles. So if you use that as edge mask, you can etch this uh, very, very nice pillar. Uh, depending on how you do it, you know, you can etch the uh, different size, different spacing, and you can even control the shape going from a pillar become a cone. Um, um, that looks uh, fairly, fairly interesting. Well, this is on single crystal silicon. Um, and uh, then one of my graduate students, Jia Zhu, he said, well, let's look at amorphous silicon. So he can etch the amorphous silicon also to form the, you know, similar type of structure is a, is a nano cone. But what's exciting is just by eyes, you see something dramatic uh, uh, happen. So um, this really motivates us to go into uh, the area using this structure for solar cells. This is a nano cone that look like black. You know, you light your solar cell look like black. They don't reflect light, they absorb all the light. And this is uh, just a vertical uh, pillar, no cone shape, just vertical. They, they are gray if it's a film. The same thickness, you know, they look like only gray. Uh, so this is very good for uh, for uh, 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 for solar cells. The reason this uh, is uh, they can uh, reflect so less light is because the so-called refractive index matching. Having the cone right there, light comes in and see the tip of the cone and going into your cone-shaped structure. And the refractive index gradually change from air to your amorphous silicon. It's not like step function change. If light comes into a morphous silicon film, um, refractive index right here is one, right here is four. So it's a dramatic change and light get refracted back. But in this case, light just can get completely trapped in and get absorbed. Um, so we have done very detailed uh, measurement. This is collaboration with Zhang Hui Fan and, and Michael McGee. Um, <coughs> Well, we haven't gone to the point yet to do battery measurement using this pillar, but soon I will, I will be able to show that. Um, well, I think at the end, uh, I want to conclude my slide and, and leaving time for discussion. Um, and uh, I would like to thank uh, graduate students again and postdoc and, and, and my collaborators and all this funding support and thank you for your attention. Batteries. A lot of lithium ion batteries are doing two, three thousand cycles now, which is really what's needed for electric vehicles. You mentioned a hundred, and can you talk a little bit more about what you expect uh, like to be? Yes, um, uh, for electrical vehicles, you would like to go to five thousand or higher. Um, um, so we are not there yet. The, there's a lot of understanding, a lot of study needed to to really study the interface between nanowire and the electrolyte organic electrolyte. That interface is very, very important to determine your cycle life. There's a side chemical reaction can taking place, you know, each time you degrade a little bit, just 0.1%, that's enough to keep your battery cycle only within several hundred. You know, for 5,000 cycle, your, your, your efficiency, charge in, charge out efficiency has to be 99.999, you know, something like that percentage, yeah. Um, you talked about what kind of research, more additional research is needed to get to the point where you can almost use it, use it in electrical vehicles. And do you have a prediction on the time? Um, so there's a multi-level research. You know, one thing is what I just mentioned, study the interface. People call it SEI and the benefit community. Um, and also you need to come up with the idea, how, how do you do manufacturing? How do you roll up this uh, battery foil and, uh, and without breaking the nano wires? There's a lot of details you need to figure that out. Uh, uh, I'm not the expert on that, and uh, this relies on the company to uh, take this uh, one step further. In terms of the time, well, 
it's always hard to predict when will that happen. But given um, you know, past experience, uh, in a typical materials-oriented technology, when it you know, goes to market, well, it's five years, seven years time scale. It's not like computer science uh, company. It can be four years. So five to seven years is more realistic. Uh, you didn't talk about the cash flow much, uh, but if you nanostructure the cash flow, are you concerned that the increased reactivity might increase the dendrite growth? Uh, actually, no, no, yeah. So, uh, as I say, silicon is actually better, you know, for many reasons uh, to decrease the dendrite growth. Uh, higher charge storage capacity doesn't mean the dendrite growth probabilities increase. Um, for cathode side, uh, we, we, we did have uh, some study, you know, Professor Kim is right here, and we have a nice collaboration on uh, lithium manganese oxide. I didn't have time to talk about uh, this, so we are, we are working on that as well, how to improve the energy density, safety costs, and everything about cathode. Yeah. You know, we had three weeks ago, we again had a very large recall of uh, explosion cost in uh, lithium ion battery, and this is the first year the lithium ion battery has gone up in price. Yes. Um, well, there's many multiple reasons behind the recall. You know, um, uh, in the manufacturing, you use this metallic foil, and if, if this metallic foil during the process, um, uh, you know, you have a dust, metallic dust right there, you can call shorting as well. And for Sony's case, uh, people think uh, it's because when you do, uh, you know, laser sealing of your battery can that produce metallic dust, you know, that can cause shorting. A little bit of shorting is enough to hit out the battery to cause bad things happen, propagate and uh, exponentially. Could you talk about the potential uh, cost per, per kilowatt hour when, when these things are developed? And uh, um, not, not yet. So, so this is uh, still too early to estimate that. Uh, uh, there's multiple parameters coming in to estimate those costs. Well, at least good thing about silicon is it's going to be very cheap in terms of materials cost. Process cost, maybe you need to learn something from how people make a mobile silicon solar cell, the row-to-row -row process. Uh, um, but I don't have the parameters to give you, uh, you know, uh, the cost uh, estimation. So I don't have the details. I read somewhere very quickly about a company in New Jersey called Emphase. This time out with a nanotechnology battery. Can you talk about that? Is that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about this company. Yeah. More questions? Okay, then let's uh, thank you.